Welcome everybody to USOW's webinar, Self-Managed Abortion on Our Own Terms. My name is Emily Escobar. I use she, her pronouns. I'm the Campaigns and Organizing Associate with the United State of Women, and I will be your main facilitator for tonight. Thank you so much for being here to learn more about self-managed abortion. As a quick disclaimer, nothing in the webinar is intended to provide advice about the legal risks associated with self-managing abortions. Laws regarding abortion vary widely by state, and some states have laws prohibiting most abortions or prohibiting assisting others in inducing abortions. I'd like to give a huge thank you to our amplification partners for making sure this event reached as many people as possible. We could not have done this work without you. As you can see from this fabulous roster of logos, we've brought together incredible organizations from across the movement that are dedicated to advancing reproductive and gender equity to ensure that this event reaches a diverse audience. It will take all of us coming together to achieve true reproductive freedom, and we're so proud, proud to stand with all of you. I'd also like to thank the rest of the USOW team who is supporting this event behind the scenes. We have Morgan Johnson, who is our Associate Director of Programs, and Susanna Berger, Senior Director of Programs and Strategic Engagement. And a special thank you to the team at Abortion on Our Own Terms for providing us with much of the content you will be learning about today. Abortion on Our Own Terms is a culture and narrative change campaign that aims to, aims to normalize self-managed abortion as an option that should be accessible for anyone who chooses it. Abortion on Our Own Terms centers the voices and experiences of people who have and have had abortions and those who face the greatest barriers to care. The Abortion on Our Own Terms Steering Committee includes reproductive justice organizations like URGE, Unite for Reproductive and Gender Equity, We Testify, All Above All, and the National Network of Abortion Funds. The campaign has more than 100 organizational partners across the country. This webinar includes a lot of information that comes from many different places, and we want to particularly thank URGE, If When How, we testify and Dr. Daniel Grossman at UCSF for their support in building this. Before we get into our agenda, I just wanna take a quick moment to discuss the lawsuit against the Food and Drug Administration's approval of Mifepristone, one of two drugs used in medication abortion. This case is not about a question of safety or medical risk associated with medication abortion. It is purely about anti-abortion leaders' continued efforts to limit access to abortion care and restrict our reproductive rights. One of our guest speakers today will be discussing the case details and implications later in the program. So we have a packed agenda for today. We'll be going over the history and background of self-managed abortion, facts about who is using self-managed abortion right now, the intersection between criminalization and self-managed abortion, and then we'll end off with a mini training to help us take action to help spread the word about self-managed abortion. So we've got an incredible, amazing line of speakers for tonight. In addition to myself, you'll be hearing from Gerald Hayes, Movement Building Director with If When How, 
Faith Garcia, California State Organizer with URGE, and our very own USOW Ambassador, Precious McKesson. And of course, I also want to thank Nat Skinner, our ASL interpreter, who will be providing interpretation for the evening. So just a few housekeeping notes. Please direct all questions to the Q&A box that you should see down below, or you can direct them to our email at women at civicnation.org. And you can turn on the closed captioning function by clicking on the captions CC icon at the bottom of your screen. All right, let's get into it. So what is self-managed abortion? A self-managed abortion is an abortion that someone does on their own. It's done without the supervision of a licensed medical provider. It is often supported by friends, family members, or partners. There are a number of different ways that people choose to self-manage their abortions. It can be with a medication regimen of pills, manual means like abortion massage or extraction, herbs, or it can incorporate other traditional practices. As our partners that we testify say, abortions have been around as long as people could become pregnant. For centuries, people did abortions on their own using herbs, teas, or other methods passed down from families and cultural traditions over generations. Some of those traditions are still used today. For today's webinar, we will be focusing on medication abortion, also known as the abortion pill. A quick disclaimer, this information should not be considered medical advice. So medication abortion is an FDA approved method to end pregnancy up to 10 weeks after the first day of your last period. Medication abortion consists of two medications, mifepristone and misoprostol, sorry about that. You can take a mifepristone pill first, followed by a misoprostol pills 24 to 48 hours later. Medication abortion is safe. Scientific studies have found that people who self-manage using pills with accurate information are able to do so safely and effectively. Abortion pills are 95 to 98% effective. Today, 54% of people who end pregnancies in the U.S. do so safely and effectively with pills. Now, I'd like to introduce one of USOW's ambassadors, Precious McKesson, who will be discussing the importance of community abortion care. Thank you, Emily. So today we're gonna to talk about um, erasing community abortion care. Uh, prior to the medicalization of abortion, communities provided self-managed abortion via traditional herbs and medicine. Much of what we can document about indigenous herbal practices come through the white lens. But we know since time in memorial, medicine keepers in our community, communities use herbs to help manage fertility, including abortion. As early as 1705, we have documentation of native and African enslaved folks in Suriname who were using the seed of the peacock flower as an abortion medication. Indigenous women living in what would become the US space children more widely apart from their settler white women. The most common forms of abortion were herbs and abortion massage. These methods have been used across the world for centuries and highlight the ways our communities have managed their reproductive health care on their own. So let's talk about some ways that this information and knowledge gets taken out of our communities and what they might have looked like. I really want to emphasize that this is not an easy subject to discuss, but it's very important that we acknowledge the history of this country to help us make sense of why things are the way they are today. So first, colonization. This includes specific tactics like criminalizing indigenous practices, targeting leaders and lineage, lineage holders, genocide, targeting our communities for eradication, thus community knowledge is lost as our communities experience genocidal attacks. Medicalization, eliminating traditional knowledge and practices by removing care from communities instead of placing this care with, by re, instead of replacing this care with Western medical practices. Conversion, by imposing outside religious standards on 
our communities through proselytizing and conversion and traditional practices were now seen as sins and things to be eradicated. And lastly, capitalism. The for-profit healthcare system puts a price on all forms of healthcare and this denies access to people who don't have the means, of, the means to pay for it. Right now, I want to make sure that we're holding space for our communities, specifically black, indigenous and people of color who have most directly felt the impact of these systems. So next we're gonna go into re revitalizing community care. And that's why, and that's why when we do the work of reproductive justice, we center our own culture, traditions, and knowledge as a way to fight back against colonial frameworks. And our communities are the heart of self-managed abortion, the self-managed abortion movement. It was Brazilian women in the 1980s who first realized that they could use misoprostol, a clear, an ulcer medication, to cause an abortion. So our communities have been in the have been the folks who continue to reclaim traditional forms of self-managed abortion and also the ones who advance self-managed abortion, abortion pills. Now we know this is a lot. This is heavy stuff that we talked about. So right now I'm asking if you just take a deep breath together, you're gonna inhale, then exhale. And now I would like to introduce our next speaker, Faith Garcia, California State Organizer for URGE, Unite for Reproductive and Gender Equity, who will tell us a little bit more about who is using self-managed abortion. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, again, my name is Faith Garcia. My pronouns are she, they, and I'm the California State Organizer for URGE, which stands for Unite for Reproductive and Gender Equity. Um, and I'm going to be talking to you all today about who is self-managing and why they might be self-managing their own abortions. Um, so just to begin, before and after Roe, so when Roe was in place prior to last year's Dobbs Supreme Court decision, Black, Indigenous, people of color, LGBTQ, low income, undocumented, disabled, those living in rural communities, and young people face barriers to accessing any type of reproductive health care. This could be for various reasons, but we could start off with one of the primary barriers to access, which is insurance status and affordability. Around 30 million people across the US do not have health insurance. Um, there's also the Hyde Amendment, which restricts federal Medicaid coverage for low income people from paying for abortion unless it falls under one of their limited exception rules. In 16 states, um, they allow their state Medicaid coverage to be used for abortion care beyond the limited expectation um, exception provided federally. Um, only six states require abortion coverage in private health insurance plans. 25 states restrict abortion coverages in plans offered through health insurance exchanges. And 22 states restrict abortion coverage in health insurance plans for public employees. So this turns abortion into a costly out-of-pocket expense for most. Um, also, just for some context, an abortion can cost from $550 going to $750 and beyond, depending on someone's location and their trimester. Um, I also, throughout this, am going to be mentioning some studies and statistics, but I just want to give a warning that it is going to be using gendered language. Sadly, a lot of studies that are out in publication use gendered language and only really um, do studies for that. So um, the UC San Francisco did a study called the Turnaway Study, and they found that denying women an abortion creates economic hardships that last years after. Um, so this could look like an increase in household poverty lasting at least four years, an increase in a woman's debt and lowering their credit scores, and even impacting them by not having enough money to cover basic living expenses like food, housing, and transportation. So foregoing the cost of accessing care, especially when black and brown folks make considerably less money, um, adds yet another hurdle when seeking abortion care services while in a white supremacist healthcare system and only adds to the criminalization, surveillance, and stigma of these communities. 
With all that being said, it is often primarily Black, Indigenous, people of color, LGBTQ plus people, undocumented young people, and low income folks who often bear the burnt of other restrictions placed on abortions. Young people need confidential and safe access to a full range of reproductive services. And in many states, young people are required to obtain consent or notify a parent before they can receive abortion care. And more and more states are enacting parental bills of right laws, um, which of course sounds ridiculous. Um, and the court allows these laws as long as they include judicial bypass, which is a very narrow exception and complete circular logic, as young people are required to prove to the judge that they are mature enough before they can access an abortion, and if not, to be forced to continue pregnancy. Um, so having to display trauma for the courts and putting a judge in a position to make reproductive health care decisions for young people is harmful and completely blocked for those most vulnerable. Moreover, um, finding childcare or taking off time from work or finding transportation if needed, or even the fear of being deported or questioned about citizenship status creates more obstacles to access. And even with health insurance, there could be barriers with finding a medical center, such as a hospital or a clinic that offers reproductive health services, and even fewer that offer access to abortions. Then finding a clinic or a medical center, especially if they live in a rural community, is just yet again another barrier to access. In 2019, um, data from the CDC revealed that young Black and Hispanic women were more likely to get an abortion than white women due to racial health disparities that contribute to maternal mortality, maternal mortality rates sorry, um, that are three times as higher for Black women than white women, as well as other negative outcomes. So as you can see, everything kind of goes full circle. And this is true if we start with any barrier, which is why anti-abortion organizations have attacked this procedure from every single angle. And now that Roe is gone, all these barriers have come to light even more by the majority of America and not just those who were already facing barriers to access when Roe was still standing. Before Dobbs and the overturning of Roe, 54% of abortions were medication abortions. And now that Roe has been overturned, we know that those numbers are only going to go up. Once Roe fell, the Washington Post disclosed that one in three cis women lost access to abortion. But as more restrictive laws continue to come out and the number um, that number is predicted to increase over time. Um, and after Roe was struck down, 5.7 million Latinas across the U.S. lost access to any type of reproductive health service. And the state abortion bans threatened more than 6.5 million Latinas. And sadly, due to criminalization and that being more of a concern for BIPOC communities, um, there aren't many studies or stats on other BIPOC communities beyond Latins. Um, but as a result of a total abortion ban, um, Black, Indigenous, and people of color um, are already facing poor healthcare systems and access and are now facing even more criminalization and arrest, especially black and brown folks and trans and non-binary. In a 2017 survey of cisgender women who self-manage their abortions, it showed that black indigenous people of color, immigrants and low income people were more likely than their white counterparts to self-manage their abortions. And black and Latin cis women being the most likely to report this. In a 2019 survey of trans and non-binary and gender expansive folks found that one in five who had ever been pregnant attempted to self-manage their abortions. I bring up these stats because um, they're important to acknowledge and to give you all a visual of who is more likely to self-manage their abortions. Um, there could be multiple reasons why one might self-manage their abortions. So as mentioned before, it may be someone's only option due to restrictions and cost. Um, but for Black, Indigenous, people of color, and LGBTQ plus people, it could be a way to take control of the reproductive health, freedom, and safety. We know that BIPOC and LGBTQ 
communities are more likely to self-manage their own abortions in the safety of their homes because of the violent and racist past and present of the medical system. Um, and as stated in the beginning of the webinar, BIPOC communities have been self-managing their own abortions for centuries with and without modern Western medicine. So our communities being able to take control of their own reproductive health is something so beautiful and should be celebrated, whether it's through modern Western medicine or ancestral practices. Um, so yeah, that is all I got for y'all. Um, but I do want to say that both Urge and If When How are members of the Abortion on Our Own Terms campaign, which um, destigmatizes and educates people about self-managed abortions. Um, and you can sign up to learn more on the website that was dropped earlier. And um, you can also use our abortion pills belong here filters on Instagram through at abortion on our own terms. Thank you so much for having me, y'all. Awesome. Thank you so much, Faith. And thank you for using an intersectional framework to talk about this issue. So now we've laid the context. We're reminded of our own cultural traditions and heritage around self-managed abortion. We understand our communities already self-managed. And in fact, Black, Brown, trans, and non-English speaking folks are the most likely to attempt to self-manage. One of the biggest barriers to self-managed abortion is criminalization. Some people who want to end their own pregnancies are unjustly interrogated, arrested, and charged by law enforcement. A person's intersecting identities, including their race, immigration status, or geographic location can make them even more vulnerable to criminalization. With that, I'd like to welcome our next speaker, Gerald Hayes, Movement Building Director at If When How, who will discuss more about the criminalization of self-managed abortion. Hi everyone, um, my name is Cheryl Hayes, I use she, her pronouns, and I'm the Movement Building Director at If, When, How, Lawyering for Reproductive Justice. Um, and before we get started, just wanna share a little about my organization. Um, if, When, How, uh, Lawyering for Reproductive Justice is an or a national organization that transforms the law and policy landscape through advocacy, support, and organizing so that all people have the power to determine if, when, and how to define, create, and sustain families with dignity and to actualize sexual and reproductive well being on their own terms. Um, we are the national leader on the legal response to the criminalization of people who self manage their abortions outside the clinical setting. And we offer a legal support helpline, litigation counsel, and financial assistance through our Repro Legal Helpline. Um, and we, I'm sorry, our Repro Legal Defense Fund um, to support anyone who is prosecuted um, for either self-managing their abortion or for helping someone to self-manage their abortion. Um, so I'm going to start with by talking a little bit about um, the criminalization of abortion. Um, so as criminalization of self-managed abortion continues in this country, we know many more people will face the risk of being investigated arrested and imprisoned um, in the years to come. And we know that because of how safe medication abortion is, if a person decides to self-manage their abortion, their risk is not primarily a health risk, but is instead a legal risk. Um, and because of this, um, and, and because of the ways that this um, varies state by state, um, we know that, that people will, will face um, different levels of risk in part based on their identity. Um, so broadly, there are several factors that we know um, that can, can and do play a part in someone's risk of criminalization. Um, there are personal identity factors. Um, so we know that uh, BIPOC, that's Black Indigenous People of Color, are disproportionately impacted by uh, self-managed abortion criminalization, as are people who are living in poverty. And what the particular law says or does not say um, it depends on where uh, that person is. Um, so that also plays a role, um, as does what prosecutors decide to pursue. Um, so there are a lot of circumstantial factors that can impact um, someone's risk, in, uh, including any physical evidence 
or whether other people know um, that someone self-managed their abortion. Um, so other people being involved uh, include medical professionals who are re reporting um, a suspected uh, self-managed abortion um, to, to the police. That's typically how um, investigations start. I don't know if you can see, I'm wearing a, a, a shirt that we, uh, saying that we uh, put out about don't talk to cops, particularly in the context um, of, of self-managed abortion, um, because and for, for most of these cases, you know, most of the of, of what is gathered is actually circumstantial um, and is typically used outside of the, the actual um, ways that the law is intended to be used. And so we, um, you know, want to note that for some folks, the, the way that they get investigated, um, in addition to the medical professionals who may contact authorities for someone that they su suspect of an SMA, um, other folks that we um, have noted that have been involved with turning somebody in inc uh, can include family members, uh, can include partners or actually family members of partners um, or friends who don't, um, any of these folks who don't agree with someone's decision to terminate their pregnancy. Um, and so, so in this age of, of technology, uh, people have to be very careful about, you know, what they text to their friends, what information is shared, um, because all of that can come back um, uh, to be part of circumstantial evidence uh, that can be used um, by, by um, law enforcement um, and by prosecutors. To, to prosecute a case. Um, we also note that for medical professionals, um, including um, emergency room providers, for social workers, for nurses, there is no medical, um, there, there's no duty to report in any state um, of somebody who is uh, suspected of uh, self-managing their abortion. Um, so that there is no, you know, there it's actually in some places a violation of, of people's um, privacy um, to disclose information related to their case. Um, there is no actual duty um, that any medical professional has to report um, if there is a suspected uh, self-managed abortion. Um, and primarily how this, how this comes up is um, because depending on the combination of pills that somebody may have and because of you know, reactions to their bodies, typically speaking, when you are taking medication abortion, um, it, you are actually, it, it, what is happening is mimicking the same thing that happens with a miscarriage. Um, there's a lot of cramping. Sometimes there is a lot of bleeding that can happen. And if somebody isn't clear on what to expect, um, they might fear that you know something has has gone wrong, or that um, you know that they're they they get scared, um, and they may go in uh, into a medical facility to to get um, treatment. And in some cases, there are complications that can arise. Um, a lot of times, it may be that somebody is a lot further along than they realized um, when they are taking a medication abortion. Um, and so they may present themselves to um, an emergency room or to a clinic or to, um, you know, to, to a hospital. Um, and in those cases, it is the it is a medical professional who believes that that somebody you know suspects suspect somebody of self-managing their abortion, and um, that turns them into law enforcement. Um, but from you know from a medical uh, perspective. It actually shows up unless somebody, you know, usually when people are taking the pills, they're taking them orally, unless um, there are also methods where you can um, um, use the uh, pills through the vaginal. Um, and, th and that's the situation where they're, where if the pills haven't fully dissolved, that they might be present. Otherwise, if somebody has taken the medication um, orally, it presents the exact same way. It looks the exact same way um, as a as a miscarriage, and so there's no reason that, from a medical um, perspective, that uh, somebody presenting with complications should be treated any differently. But we know that based on people's identity, based on who is believed um, when they are, when they you know say what has happened, um, that folks have been you know surveilled, have been. Um, you know, profiled um, and, and certain populations are mo more likely to be, um, uh, have connected to law enforcement. Um, so that's, that's sort of the criminalization of um, how that happens, you know, when somebody presents. Um, let's, we'll talk next about the sort of current legal landscape and how, how people, why, you know, people are getting criminalized um, for, for self-managed abortion. So, Currently, 
there are actually only two states that explicitly criminalize self-managed abortion. Uh, that's Nevada and South Carolina. Uh, and we are working with, with state advocates in both of those states um, to actually try to repeal um, those, uh, those, those explicit statutes. Um, there were three other states um, that had have previously had those, those statutes that, that in the past um, few years, there have been successful, um, uh, those, those laws have successfully been repealed off the books. Um, but you know, there are only two states that explicitly criminalize self-managed abortion. However, um, there are uh, 26 states that have investigated um, or arrested uh, people for an alleged self-managed abortion. Um, so there's kind of a disconnect between what is the law and how people um, have been criminalized. Um, most recently, actually, uh, Wyoming uh, just became the first state to explicitly ban the use of abortion pills. Um, and even though the law explicitly states um, that the pregnant patient is exempt from prosecutions or fines, um, but this law would apply to providers and potentially anyone who helps a pregnant uh, person uh, secure and take the pills, we know that even in places where the law explicitly states that these laws are not to be used against a pregnant person, that that's not actually the reality um, in many states. Um, so what we have seen is a motivated prosecutor who will use everything in the kitchen sink against somebody who is suspected of self-managing their abortion. Um, there are you know, criminal abortion laws that make it a crime for anyone who is not a licensed medical provider to perform an abortion. Um, and the prosecutors will actually use those laws against people who self-manage abortion. So even in the cases where the, the laws were never meant to be used um, against a pregnant person, they will claim that the pregnant person is providing, um, you know, is, is providing the abortion and that they're not licensed to do that. And so they'll, they'll try to use um, the, those types of um, laws. Um, they will also use um, fetal harm laws, um, which uh, created with the intention of actually protecting pregnant people from harm that comes to them um, that have actually been used against the pregnant person themselves. Um, and there's also prescription drug laws um, that are used as well as um, archaic um, laws that have not been commonly commonly used, um, like abuse of a corpse or concealing a birth. Um, these have all come up in different um, SMA prosecutions. Um, and so, you know, with the way that, um, that now because you know, we could, we have the, we have had the fall um, of Roe. We have seen the ways that anti-abortion um, um, folks will use the law to whatever extent that they can, and um, even laws that were, you know, you, even using the laws in ways that they were never intended um, to use. What we have seen, um, you know, basically since the Dobbs decision, is. Um, our, our anti-abortion proponents trying to use the laws in whatever way possible um, to eliminate access to abortion. Um, so primarily, um, so just as a, a background on when Roe was decided, um, the Roe v. Wade case, that was focused on providers. So it wasn't actually focused as much on pregnant people and what pregnant people needed, but it was instead um, focused on the provision uh, of abortion. Um, and so uh, since that case, there have been a number of states that have tried to, um, you know, really restrict abortion, uh, the provision of abortion care in whatever way possible. That means um, there are things that are called CHOP laws, that's the targeted regulation of abortion providers. I'm really focused on, you know, trying to make um, the provision of abortion care as limited as possible. Um, we've known that even, you know, since people have been able to get pregnant, people have also been self-managing um, their abortion. Um, and so that has been a way that people have been able to kind of take abortion into their own hands and avoid, um, in some ways, avoid um, prosecution, particularly because a lot of times that is happening in private. But with, you know, with um, many states now being able to explicitly um, ban abortion, ban uh, the provision of abortion. Now, um, one of the, the tools that are being used is going after the methods in which people are, are able to access abortion, including self-managed abortion. Um, so this brings us to the current uh, case that um, is happening in, in Texas. And so just to give a little basic background, um, you know, it was as mentioned at the at the top. Um, there's these two um, in medication abortion. There's primarily two um, medications, two drugs that are used: um, mifepristone and misoprostol. 
Um, so mifepristone is a drug um, that has actually been more, that is of the two drugs is the one that is more regulated by the Food and Drug Administration, the FDA. And until recently, the FDA had strict requirements about who was able to distribute mifepristone, um, and the pills were primarily only available um, by approved clinicians. Um, that's the availability through, if you were getting it through, um, trying to you know trying to do it through a medical um, provider. Um, Additionally, um, a number of states also impose additional restrictions for access to mifepristone, including requirements for the pills to be administered in person, uh, restricting the use of telemedicine, and requiring that a doctor uh, provide the pill and not other clinic staff, um, like a nurse practitioner, um, and re requiring them that the doctor be present, not just, you know, not just a part of the um, uh, of the appointment, but actually that the doctor had to be present and watch the person uh, take the pills in their office. So they had many sort of um, restrictions that were already in place. Um, in, part in part because of the pandemic and then the need for increased use of telemedicine and a lot of advocacy from groups trying to um, make mifepristone more available um, and loosen the sort of restrictions on who is, who is able to um, provide access to mifepristone, um, the FDA actually um, was making, was in, has been in the process of making mifepristone more widely available, including um, by having access through pharmacies and through um, mail order um, uh, uh, prescriptions. Um, and medication abortion is most effective when both mifepristone and misoprostol are utilized. Um, although misoprostol is effective on its own, it's not quite as effective and can have additional side effects. Um, so for, for folks who are trying to access medication abortion, having access to regimens that include mifepristone are more effective um, and actually reduce um, the number of side effects. So that's a little bit of the, the sort of background on um, on access, you know, and the ways that the FDA has has sort of regulated um, my, uh, mifepristone. Um, so with this lawsuit, um, the plaintiffs are actually um, anti-abortion doctors um, who want the Food and Drug Administration to remove its approval um, of mifepristone and no longer allow the drug to be used by abortion providers um, for medication abortion, um, to no longer allow it to be available um, at at pharmacies um, or to be available through the mail. Um, and the plaintiffs specifically brought this case uh, before Judge Matthew Kaczmarek, who is a Trump appointed judge, uh, who, is, um, who is openly um, pro-life and has already pres presided over cases with his demonstrated anti-choice bias. Um, and so essentially in this case, um, for a number of reasons, and I know primarily this audience is, is not necessarily um, lawyers, so I'm going to not get too deep into um, the all of the different reasons that this case doesn't have standing or should not have even gotten to this point. But essentially, um, the reason that this, this case has been able to move forward is because of these activist judges that have been um, uh, appointed by the, that were appointed through the, the Trump administration. And because of the, the, the current uh, makeup of the Supreme Court, typically speaking, these these types of, of cases would not have proceeded as far um, because they you know they knew that they would have uh, in previous <laughs> under previous um, iterations of the Supreme Court um, they would not have gotten this far um, and there there would always be the risk of them getting you know beaten back down by the Supreme Court. What's at stake in this case is that essentially. If the judge rules um, that he has authority to order uh, the Food and Drug Administration to remove its um, approval for uh, mifepristone, that it would essentially make access to mifepristone much um, much more restricted in, in our country, um, and would like basically lead to a lot more uncertainty. We are already um, from a legal landscape, we are already have, we, there is so much uncertainty about the, in any given state, um, what the, the sort of legal risks are. This case is adding to that, um, is, is adding to that uncertainty. Um, it is unclear, um, you know, what would happen at the next stage if this does, generally speaking, a, a case like this would usually get, then get 
um, appealed up to the Supreme Court. It's unclear if the Supreme Court would actually take up this case. So the Supreme Court doesn't have to hear any cases. It can basically say, we're not going to take this up and whatever a lower court has stayed, um, stay, you know, uh, holds in place. Um, it's unclear if the FDA will actually, you know, based on, on this judge's decision, if they will actually, um, you know, they might push back and say, you actually don't have authority over us. Um, so it depends on what's the backbone um, of the FDA. Um, and it's taken a lot of advocacy to even get the FDA to loosen some of the um, unnecessary restrictions that it's had around Mifepristone. So it's unclear um, if the Biden administration is really going to push to make sure that the FDA is as strong as possible and pushes back against this. Um, but the main thing that um, th these types of, of lawsuits are bringing is a lot of uncertainty, um, is a lot of people, you know, of, of legal uncertainty, um, but also to, you know, for pharmacies that were starting to, were, you know, getting prepared to um, be able to provide um, mifepristone within um, the, the pharmacies, that some have, you know, pulled back. So I believe it's Walgreens has announced that they won't be providing um, mifepristone. Um, other pharmacies are are sort of figuring out, you know, what's what's their legal risk of of uh, potentially providing um, this this medication. What this means for for folks who self manage abortion um, is so so right now um, you cannot get mifepristone um, unless you're going to a pro provider. Um, unless you are getting the, the pills from outside the outside of the country. So there are people who are accessing pills from other countries. Um, so mifepristone is uh, more widely available um, in other countries without as many of the restrictions that our FDA has imposed on it. Um, so there are um, folks who will still be able to, you know, access um, the medication as they have been um, through the mail, but you know, again, that it's not a health risk, it's more of a legal risk. If the FDA, you know, then removes its approval, um, that does increase the risk of criminalization and it just gives prosecutors even more um, tools to be able to prosecute somebody um, who is suspected of a self-managed abortion if they are utilizing um, pills that they have, um, you know, received from abroad that are now essentially um, have been removed from FDA approval. Um, so it's unclear exactly, you know, how this judge is going to rule um, based on the merits of this case alone. It should never have been able to get to this point, and there's not really a legal um, leg um, that this lawsuit should move forward. And instead, what this means is, you know, if this uh, judge decides to rule in favor of the FDA, it sort of, you know, gives us some hope that there is still a rule of law in this country, and um, that the that judges, even conservative judges, are still. Um, you know, willing to apply the law as it is supposed to be. However, if this judge rules against um, the FDA, it really shows that, you know, judges are really just putting their politics um, on display. Um, and there's, you know, because there's not really, um, there's, there's not really a backstop anymore in the Supreme Court, it's unclear then what the, you know, further um, restrictions that can happen um, and, and, you know, the other side just really finding these conservative judges, these really um, um, uh, judges who are, are willing to, to flout the law, um, what they would, you know, what types of, of, of further lawsuits that they will bring in this case. So there's a lot of uncertainty, um, but we're still holding out hope that this judge may do the right thing and actually follow the rule of law. I'm happy to answer more questions, um, but I will stop there. Thank you so much, Daryl, for that incredibly helpful breakdown. Um, at the United State of Women, we believe that no one should face criminal charges, incarceration, or any form of punishment for making their own pregnancy decisions, including abortion, or for helping somebody do that. And I just want to remind folks that anything on this webinar um, should not be considered either legal or medical advice. There's a ton of things that we can do to avoid exposure to criminal risk, such as if somebody is self-managing an abortion and has questions, they can call the MA hotline to talk to a doctor by text or phone to keep themselves medically safe or contact ReproCare to get emotional support and information. The ER doesn't have to be the first stop. The uh, the re le sorry the Repro Legal Helpline, which Gerald just mentioned, can help you with legal questions about your rights and risks regarding self-managed abortion and your rights and legal risks in supporting somebody. 
the leap the repro legal defense fund will help make sure folks get the legal defense bill funds and other support that they need um know your local resources abortion funds in communities across the country are helping individuals understand the laws and restrictions that may be in place as they're seeking abortion care visit usow's abortion access hub usow.org backslash repro to find your local abortion fund. Share abortion stories. Destigmatizing abortion helps contribute to decriminalization. Connect with We Testify to share your self-managed abortion story. And I just wanna take a quick moment. I know that we're a little bit ahead of schedule. So um, Gerald, I know that you offered to answer some questions and I do see that there are a few questions in the Q&A. So I'm gonna go ahead and actually hand it back to you. Um, and see if there are any questions you um, want to address. Yeah, so just looking, um, and thanks for folks who have um, provided their questions in the Q&A, please continue uh, to um, add those in. Um, so I'm just gonna um, look here at some of the, the questions that folks have um, identified. Um, so yeah, so I can talk a little bit more and get into, I. I wanted to make sure that we had plenty of time. Um, I can get a little bit more into the case. Um, so the case that is is being brought is actually being brought um, by a, a really um, conservative group um, that is is really focused on trying to like it's it's that spaghetti like throw whatever at the wall and see what kind of sticks. Um, and so what they are they actually have brought the suit on behalf of anti uh, anti choice. Uh, providers who have basically said that the um, them having to provide medication abortion or even the uh, like just the availability of medication abortion makes their jobs a lot harder um, because they are resources that are being used um, to you know for for anyone who is showing up to um, emergency rooms or to other you know um, hospitals because of um, complications from. Uh, a cell, from uh, the, the medication abortion, um, which is actually from a <laughs> from a health standpoint is actually so far from from the, the actual reality. Um, so there are more complications that that happen every year from Viagra. There are more complications that happen from people taking Tylenol um, that have you know that are that interfere with their liver. Um, so there are actually other medications that if they were truly focused on, you know, um, trying to reduce like the impact, um, medication abortion is, is not it. Medication abortion is actually, you know, has, has, has one of the most effective and one of the safest medications that are happening. And so the restrictions that have happened around medication abortion have been political, not from a health perspective. Additionally, the you know the time that um, the the statute of limitations is actually told. Um, so so uh, the FDA approved mifepristone more than twenty years ago. Um, so there's been twenty years of people safely being able to utilize medication abortion. And so for these these groups, actually, they shouldn't you know they shouldn't have standing because the statute of limitations has told. Um, in addition, the lawyers for the FDA have have argued that there's actually more um, harm that would come from from reducing um, access to abortion um, than there would be uh, by allowing a, a, um, a mifepristone to be available. The other one of the other reasons that their legal case should not have standing is because they are arguing um, that you know that the the best course of action is for the FDA to remove. Um, mifepristone as a medication abortion um, to be available um, for for pregnant folks who are who are terminating their pregnancies. Um, mifepristone is also the medication that is used um, for for people who are experiencing miscarriage. So it would actually uh, in increase complications for for people who are miscarrying um, because it's a, it's it's actually the exact same medication. Um, in addition. Um, the sort of arguments that they made were that, you know, um, that it wouldn't be as, you know, removing mifepristone wouldn't be as uh, detrimental because people could still use misoprostol, um, which, which does not have as, you know, is not as, is not as regulated as heavily by the FDA. Um, and this is true. People could, could use my, um, just misoprostol, although 
as we mentioned before, it's better if there is a combination, uh, having access to both um, mifepristone and misoprostol. But it actually goes against their argument um, because basically abortion would still be available. What they're what they're trying to argue, they're trying to argue it both ways. They're trying to say, um, you know, that this that this this is a detriment to to uh, abortion or to um, medical providers who have to go against their values um, by having you know by by having mifepristone available. Um, but it's okay that they can restrict mifepristone because misoprostol would also be available. So essentially, they're trying to argue both sides um, in a way that neither of those arguments are, from a legal perspective, have 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 any standing. Um, so there are a number of reasons that um, a lot of, of legal professionals are looking at this case scratching their heads because for a number of reasons, this case should not have gotten as far as it is. And it's actually a signal to the state of our legal affairs um, that judges might you know, be willing to flout all of the sort of um, legal precedent. Um, and that's really one of the things that we're really concerned about um, with, with this case that we have been concerned about um, since the Dobbs decision um, has been made because basically what it has been is a license for states to, to you know, and a license for um, anti-choice groups to try to, um, you know, to, to try to, to put as many restrictions in place. Um, and, you know, it's, it, it actually goes against um, many of our sort of, you know, legal values, um, how this case has been able to, to sort of move forward. So um, that's the answer for the uh, standing one. Um, let's see. Yes, there are uh, practical support groups. Um, yes, please sign up with organizations like ARC Southeast and abortion funds um, that uh, yes, and and um, in particular around um, the safety aspect, um, many of our our groups um, who have been um, who who go through a really strict process for approving volunteers, um, please use please use those practical support um, networks because um, they have also been we've we've also consulted with with different um, practical support groups and abortion funds on the sort of legal risks. So they are aware of the legal risks that they're taking, and they have to, have taken precautions to mitigate those risks. Um, so from a legal standpoint. Um, we pref prefer folks to, to go to um, uh, National Network of Abortion Funds as an incredible resource um, to, you know, um, they work with um, all of the different abortion funds um, to, so we encourage you to um, support groups like that. Um, and, and because we don't, we don't want people to, you know, there are, are people who have ill intent uh, for folks. Um, we've seen this at a wide level with the crisis pregnancy centers where people use manipulation and coercion um, uh, it, to manipulate people who are, are looking for abortion support. Um, and so we um, are worried, concerned about that for people who might be offering up um, support for somebody who is um, seeking an abortion or who's, who's um, uh, trying to do a, a self-managed abortion um, that they, you know, might have ill intent for them. So we definitely, um, want you to go with the, the, the groups that have um, vetting. Um, uh, so the question about violation of HIPAA, it, it is a violation of HIPAA. Um, and that is actually some of the work um, that our organization is doing along um, with other um, um, organizations around um, stricter um, protections around people's privacy um, and around how um, privacy law is is working um, to make sure that people understand, um, you know, what the HIPAA standards are, um, and to reinforce with medical professionals, especially for social workers, for nurses, um, that there is no um, requirement for for any medical professional um, to report a suspected self managed abortion um, to to police. And yes, it, it is actually medical providers who are um, reporting um, uh, SMAs um, because, and a lot of times it's people who, it's providers who are anti-choice and don't believe, you know, somebody when they when they present um, and say that, that they're having complications, if they suspect that somebody, um, you know, uh, if they, they think that somebody, you know, wanted to do this intentionally, they're the ones who are, are reporting um, SMA to law enforcement. Um, I'll stop there for a bit, um, so just make sure we have time for other uh, Q&A.
Thank you so much. We we could have you here all day <laughs> if we were able to. Um, but with that, um, now that you've learned about self-managed abortion, it's time to take action to spread by spreading the word about self-managed abortion with your local networks. A great way to destigmatize self-managed abortion is to have open conversations with your friends and family. So to that end, we're going to learn how to use Impactive which is USOW's digital organizing platform for our volunteers and ambassadors. We're going to learn how to use the app, get started on the campaign, and send messages to our friends. So make sure that you get your phones out. And if you have any questions about Impactive, about logging into the app, creating an account, et cetera, please drop them into the Q&A box and our team will be happy to help. So let's start with what is Impactive? Impactive is both a mobile app and a web platform where volunteers like you can do different things like take multiple actions within the same, same platform, such as sending friend to friend messages or sharing links to your social media accounts. You can fill reports and share information about your outreach efforts with USOW. And you can keep in touch with fellow USOW ambassadors and volunteers. For today, we'll be using the tool to text our friends and family about self-managed abortion. So please get your phone ready and follow along. We're going to get through the nitty gritty part of setting up your account before we can get to the fun part, which is starting our texting. So start by searching for the app, which is called Impactive in the App Store or Google Play if you have an Android and download it to your phone. That's it. Once it's downloaded, you're going to want to open the app, and then you're going to enter our campaign code, which is 209978. That's 209978. And you're going to create an account with your name, your phone number, and your email. Impactive will send a magic link to your email account, and you'll be able to click the link and log in from there. When you open the app or the web page, you will be prompted to type in the USOW campaign code 209978. I'm gonna say it one more time, 209978. Then you'll pick your language preferences and enter your zip code and phone number. If you prefer, you can also join via the web app. Head to the link that will drop in the chat onto your computer. And I'm gonna wait a little bit while we get that dropped in the chat box. And then on the web app, you're going to click on the web link to join and sign up with your email. You'll receive a magic link that also gets sent to your email account. However, if possible, we do recommend downloading the app to your phone so that you're able to use it to send friend to friend text messages. At this point, you will sync your contacts into the app to start selecting who you will text. If you choose to sync your phone contacts with the Impactive app, United States of Women and Impactive will not own or save your data. Syncing your phone contacts is used only to track the number of friend-to-friend -friend messages you are sending to your friends and family. Okay, so now that you're all set up on Impactive, either with your phone or the web app, we will run through a short demo explaining how to take action using this tool. I promise we're almost ready to start texting. Our main goal for today is to learn how to send friend-to-friend -friend messages to help spread the word about self-managed abortion. Friend-to-friend -friend texting on Impactive is one of the easiest and most effective ways to make an impact with USOW. You can send messages from your own phone number to your own personal contacts. So let's learn how to reach out to our friends and family about self-managed abortion. In the left corner of the app, you will see the different features of Impactive. Our main focus today is on actions. You can click actions, select friend to friend, and you will find the campaign we're texting today. It should say, text your friends about self-managed abortion. You will be able to start sending messages to your friends and family in your phone contacts shortly. The screen will show the friend to friend action you'll be using today. And don't worry, we're providing you with a script that has all the information that you need to engage in a conversation about self-managed abortion. So you're going to select start texting at the bottom of the screen. Next, since you already synced your phone contacts when you set up your account, 
you can simply select the friend or family member that you want to send a message to. So think about somebody who might be interested in the topic and wants to learn more and go ahead and choose that person. You will see a pre-written message crafted for you to send on self-managed abortion. The message will look like this, and I'm actually going to read it out loud. So the message will say, hey, I'm volunteering with the United State of Women to help spread the word about self-managed abortion. A self-managed abortion is an abortion that someone does on their own outside of a formal medical setting. Self-managed abortions include medication abortions prescribed by a doctor as well as other methods. With the recent attacks on abortion access, it is critical that our communities learn about this alternative to in-clinic care. So I'm texting you to see if you can take just three minutes to learn more about self-managed abortion. Can I send you a link to learn more? You can adjust the greeting of the message to fit how you usually talk to your friends and family. However, just please make sure that you don't change the main context of, content of the message. And then when you're ready to send your message, you're going to select send. Once you hit send, Impactive will open up your actual messaging app on your phone and you can send the message. So just make sure you hit that second send button for the second time. After you've sent each message to your friends and family, you're going to fill out a report. So filling out a report allows you to keep a record of the conversation that you're having, and it helps USOW by compiling important data about the impact of our campaigns. It's important to fill your reports accurately. This will help us clean up our data list and make sure we have the appropriate tags, allow us to schedule folks into events, and follow up appropriately. So just a few reminders, you're gonna submit reports every time you send a message. Don't wait for the conversation to end and only fill out what you know to be true. Once you've sent your message, you can click on the message icon to find your inbox. There you will see a report button. Select that button. Next, select for a friend or a contact. Then select the name of the person that you just texted so you can fill out a report for them. You'll see the information that your phone has synced into Impactive, potentially including their phone number and email. What we need you to add are any relevant tags or notes about the conversation. So for example, if they replied yes to your message asking if they want to learn more about self-managed abortion, you will simply choose the yes, we'll learn more tag and if they replied no to your message, you will choose the no won't learn more tag. You'll see the little icon switch go from gray to red when it's been selected. When you're finished, select send to campaign to ensure that we have all of the information we need to follow up with them. Finally, if your conversation with your friend or family member is ongoing, you can use the response scripts available to answer their questions and replies. So you'll see responses to questions like, why should I care? What is medication abortion? Is self-managed abortion safe? Et cetera, to help you with your replies. Remember to add a report to update tags if you learn new information through this ongoing conversation. To add a reply, head to your inbox and find the conversation you want to continue. Then select follow-up. You'll now see the pre-written response scripts pop up. So you're gonna to wanna to select the most appropriate response for the question or reply that you received. Then send your chosen reply to your friend or family member. Remember to add or update a report once you're finished. Now that you're all set up on Impactive and you've been trained on sending friend-to-friend -friend messages, it's time to text. Every time you send friend to friend messages, we recommend texting at least three people. So I'm actually gonna grab my phone and I'm gonna start texting my three friends. Uh, we're gonna play some music right now to give folks about five minutes to start sending texts and then we'll come back together at 7.10 to wrap up. So make sure that you're staying on until the end. All right, we're gonna cue the music.
There's a whole lot of people in the house Trying to smoke with the yak in your mouth And we back outside You said you outside, but you ain't that outside Worldwide hoodie with the mask outside In case you forgot how we act outside Okay, I think we can come back together now. We can get our slides back up. Awesome. Okay, so after you have sent your messages, please make sure to submit reports as they respond. Continue texting your friends and family, and please encourage others to do the same. Those are our next steps. With that, I want to say thank you for joining us for today's webinar. As we've learned today, the option of self-managed abortion can empower us to make healthcare decisions that work best for us and our bodies. This means we get to decide if, when, and how to end a pregnancy using safe, effective methods to self-manage our care. Self-managed abortion offers a path forward for abortion access that puts the power back in our hands. Once again, I want to give a huge thank you to Nat, our ASL interpreter, to the USOW team, and to our amplification partners for making sure this event reached as many people as possible. We could not do this work without you. We're so proud to have you join our community of abortion advocates. Together, we can envision a world where people can access information about abortion, particularly self-managed abortion, without stigma or fear of criminalization. Have a good night, everyone. <laughs>